am Tulika Banerjee. Today, I bring you the next learning episode in BSc Forensic Science on behalf of the content writers, Dr. G. S. Sodi and Deepika Banjari on an important unit of paper, Crime and Society, that is, Legal System in India. In this episode, we will discuss about the legal system in India and its hierarchy. We would also acquaint ourselves with a detailed discussion on Supreme Court and High Court. Dear students, let's have a look at what we are going to learn today. First is introduction to legal system in India, then is hierarchy of Indian legal system, Supreme Court, High Courts and lastly we will wind up this module with a conclusion. British rule in India introduced the common law in this country. This provided the basis of our present legal system. A legal system encompasses a set of legal principles and norms to protect and promote a secure living to its subjects in a cultured society. It recognizes rights, prescribes duties of people and provides the ways and means of enforcing the same. To achieve this, particular objective, the legal system, considering the sociological, economic and political conditions in the society, designs its own goals and evolves a set of principles or rules or laws which help the society to attain its identified goals. The first direct product of the common law system is the public law. The most important principle of it is rule of law. The rule of law implies that government authority may only be exercised in accordance with written laws which are adopted through an established procedure. The legal system derives its authority from the constitution and is deeply embedded in the political system. The Indian constitution has charged the judiciary with the primary task of promoting the rule of law limiting the power of the political executive, reviewing the rationale of the law made by the legislature, declaring remedies to those who have taken recourse to judicial process are some of the several facets that judicial enforcement of rule of law entails. Rule of law requires the supremacy of law as opposed to the supremacy of the government or any political party. Through fundamental charters, nations guarantee the rights of individuals, regulate relations between individuals and the state, distribute power among the branches of government and establish an integrated judicial system to protect and guarantee the legitimacy of the constitution's provisions and values. Within this framework, Adjudication plays a role of utmost importance as the means for safeguarding through due process, the rule of law and the supremacy of the constitution. One of the most unique features of the constitution of India is that it provides for a fundamental right to approach the supreme court for constitutional remedies against the state. Given the constitutional mandate to enable complete Justice, this fundamental right to access judicial remedies assumes a lot of significance in the form of opportunities to the Supreme Court to constructively respond to the promise of access to justice. Furthermore, every High Court is vested with the plenary power of writ jurisdiction. This power of the High Courts is wider than that of the Supreme Court. Since the High Courts are empowering to exercise this jurisdiction not only for the guarantee of a fundamental right but also for the enforcement of any other statutory right. Considering the extent of powers vested to dispense with constitutional remedies, the Supreme Court and the High Courts are referred to as the Constitutional Courts. The primary objective of any legal system ought to be guaranteed enforcement of rights as vested by the constitution 
and the laws made thereof. Judicial review is designed to prevent the cases of abuse of power and neglect of duty by public authorities. It becomes essential to first prove that a right exists, then that the particular right has been violated and therefore present justifiable claims that a remedy is warranted. The judiciary has become a potential associate of individual citizens and of action groups insisting on better performance of state institutions. It has become a byword for judicial involvement in social, political and economic affairs. India is credited with having the most powerful and independent judiciary in the world. Indian judiciary owes its origin to the judicial system which existed in the British India. The Indian judiciary administers a common law system of legal jurisdiction in which customs, precedents and legislation all codify the law of the land. The Constitution of India is the supreme legal document of its jurisdiction which extends throughout the territory of the country. After independence, the Constituent Assembly which drafted the Constitution provided for the establishment of a three-tier judiciary which is completely independent of the other two organs of the state, the executive and the legislature. Under our constitution, there is a single integrated system of courts for the union as well as the states, which administer both union and state laws and at the head of the system stands the Supreme Court of India. Below the Supreme Court are the High Courts of different states and under each High Court there are subordinate courts that is courts subordinate to and under the control of the High Courts. In a unified hierarchical judicial system which India has accepted under its constitution, vertically the Supreme Court is placed over the High Courts. Because of the fact that the constitution confers an appellate power on the Supreme Court over the High Courts, certain consequences naturally flow and follow. The word law has various interpretations. Consequently, the expression legal reform also needs to be pinned down. There are three layers in legal reform. First, there is an element of statutory law reform and there are three clear elements to statutory law reform. Weeding out old and dysfunctional elements in legislation, unification and harmonization and reducing state intervention. Second legal reform has to have an administrative law and reform component meaning the subordinate legislation in the form of rules, orders, regulations and instructions from ministries and government departments. The Supreme Court is primarily a court of appeal and has extensive appellate jurisdiction. Its primary function is to interpret the constitution and declare whether or not any legislation or administrative action is unconstitutional. The Supreme Court is the final arbiter in all constitutional controversies. The law declared by the Supreme Court is binding on all courts in India and is the law of the land. The court is a court of record and can also punish for its contempt. Any judgment of the High Court can be brought before it if the High Court certifies that the matter at hand concerns a substantial question of interpretation of law or the constitution. Appeal to the Supreme Court is not a matter of right. In cases where a High Court does not issue certificate of appeal and there exists an important legal question, recourse to special leave may be made as per the Constitution of India. This provision under Article 136 of the Constitution enables the Supreme Court to grant a special leave to appeal from any judgment, decree, determination, sentence or order in any cause or matter passed or made by any court or 
Tribunal in India. This power is extremely wide and enables the Supreme Court to act as a check against improper exercise of jurisdiction by judicial or quasi-judicial bodies as well as maintain a uniformity of legal approach. In certain special circumstances, the Supreme Court can also transfer to itself any case from any of the High Courts. This usually takes place when cases are pending before the Supreme Court and High Court or before two or more High Courts involving same or similar questions of law and the Supreme Court is satisfied either suumotu or on an application made by the Attorney General or any party to any case that such questions are of general importance. The Supreme Court may withdraw the cases from the High Courts and dispose them itself. Thus, the Supreme Court possesses the ultimate jurisdiction over all courts and legal proceedings in India and enjoys a wide appellate power. Once appointed, a judge holds office until he attains 65 years of age. He may resign his office by writing address to the president or he may be removed by the president upon an address to that effect being passed by a special majority of each house of the parliament on grounds of proved misbehavior and incapacity. The salaries and allowances of the judges are fixed high in order to secure their independence, efficiency and impartiality. The constitution also provides that the salaries of the judges cannot be changed to their disadvantage except in times of a financial emergency. The administrative expenses of the Supreme Court, the salaries, the allowances etc. of the judges are charged on the Consolidated Fund of India. In order to shield the judges from political controversies, the constitution empowers the courts to initiate contempt proceedings against those who impute motives to the judge in the discharge of their official duties. Even the parliament cannot discuss the conduct of a judge except when a resolution for his removal is before it. The Supreme Court has vast jurisdiction and its position is strengthened by the fact that it acts as a court of appeal, as a guardian of the constitution and as a reviewer of its own judgments. Article 141 declares that the law laid by the Supreme Court shall be binding on all courts within the territory of India. Its jurisdiction is divided into four categories. First is original jurisdiction and writ jurisdiction. Article 131 gives the Supreme Court exclusive and original jurisdiction in a dispute between the union and a state or between one state and another or between group of states and others. It acts therefore as a federal court that is the parties to the dispute should be the units of a federation. No other court in India has the power to entertain such disputes. Supreme Court is the guardian of fundamental rights and thus has non-exclusive original jurisdiction as the protector of fundamental rights. It has the power to issue writs such as habeas corpus, cue warranto, prohibition, certiorari and mandamus. In addition to issuing these writs, the Supreme Court is empowered to issue appropriate directions and orders to the executive also. Article 32 of the Constitution gives citizens the right to move to Supreme Court directly for the enforcement of any of the fundamental rights enumerated in Part 3 of Constitution. The second one is the advisory jurisdiction. Article 143 of the constitution vests the president the power to seek advice regarding any question of law or fact of public importance or cases belonging to the disputes arising out of pre-constitution treaties and agreements 
which are excluded from its original jurisdiction. This jurisdiction does not involve a list. The advisory opinion is not binding on the government. It is not executable as a judgment of the court and the court may reserve its opinion in controversial political cases. The third one is the appellate jurisdiction. The Supreme Court is the highest court of appeal from all courts. Its appellate jurisdiction may be divided into first cases involving interpretation of the constitution that is civil, criminal or otherwise, civil cases irrespective of any constitutional question and criminal cases irrespective of any constitutional question. Article 132 provides for an appeal to the Supreme Court by the High Court certification, the Supreme Court may grant a special leave to appeal. Article 133 provides for an appeal in civil cases and Article 134 provides the Supreme Court with appellate jurisdiction in criminal matters. However, the Supreme Court has a special appellate jurisdiction to grant in its discretion a special leave appeal from any judgment, decree sentence or order in any case or matter passed or made by any court or tribunal. The fourth one is the review jurisdiction. The Supreme Court has the power to review any judgment pronounced or order made by it. Article 137 provides for review of judgment or orders by the Supreme Court wherein subject to the provisions of any law made by the Parliament or any rules made under Article 145, the Supreme Court shall have the power to review any judgment pronounced or made by it. However, the Supreme Court jurisdiction may be enlarged with respect to any of the matters in the Union list as Parliament may by law confer. Parliament may by law also enlarge or can impose limitations on the powers and functions exercised by the Supreme Court. Since Parliament and the Judiciary are created by the Constitution, such aforesaid acts must lead to harmonious relationship between the two and must not lead to altering the basic structure of the Constitution. Moreover, all these powers can also be suspended or superseded whenever there is a declaration of emergency in the country. Under Article 214 of the Constitution of India, it is mentioned that there shall be a High Court for each state and every High Court shall be a court of record and shall have all the powers of such a court including the power to punish for contempt of itself wide Article 215 of the Constitution. However, Parliament may by law establish a common High Court for two or more states and a union territory under Article 2. 31. Every High Court shall consist of a Chief Justice and such other judges as the President may from time to time deem it necessary to appoint provisions for additional judges and acting judges being appointed by the President are also given in the Constitution. The President while appointing the judges shall consult the Chief Justice of India, the Governor of the State and also the Chief Justice of that High Court in the matter of appointment of a judge other than the Chief Justice. A judge of a High Court shall hold office until the age of 62 years. A judge can vacate the seat by resigning, by being appointed a judge of the Supreme Court or by being transferred to any other High Court by the President. A judge can be removed by the President on grounds of misbehavior or incapacity in the same manner in which a judge of the Supreme Court is removed. The jurisdiction of the High Court of a state is coterminous with the territorial limits of that state. The original jurisdiction of High Court includes the enforcement of the fundamental rights, settlement of disputes relating to the election to union and state legislatures and 
jurisdiction over revenue matters also. Its appellate jurisdiction extends to both civil and criminal matters. On the civil side, an appeal to the High Court is either a first appeal or second appeal. The criminal appellate jurisdiction consists of appeals from the decisions of a sessions judge or an additional session judge where the sentence is of imprisonment exceeding seven years, an assistant session judge, metropolitan magistrate of other judicial magistrate in certain certified cases other than petty cases. The writ jurisdiction of High Court means issuance of writs or orders for the enforcement of fundamental rights and also in cases of ordinary legal rights. High Court also has the power to superintend all other courts and tribunals except those dealing with armed forces. It can also frame rules and issue instructions for guidance from time to time with directions for speedier and effective judicial remedy. High Court also has the power to transfer cases to itself from subordinate courts concerning the interpretation of the constitution. However, the parliament by law may extend the jurisdiction of a High Court to or exclude the jurisdiction of a High Court from any union territory. High Court's power of original and appellate jurisdiction is also circumscribed by the creation of central administrative tribunals with respect to services under the union and it has no power to invalidate a central act, rule, notification or order made by any administrative authority of the union. As mentioned earlier, the High Courts are courts of record and as such can punish for their contempt. The constitution makers realized that the high courts were destined to play a pivotal role in the administration of justice, not only in deciding civil and criminal matters, but also by way of protecting fundamental rights guaranteed under the constitution, for which high courts are also conferred with its jurisdiction. Therefore, a high degree of judicial independence was given to the high courts. They enjoy original as well as appellate jurisdiction and derive their jurisdiction from the constitution, codes of civil and criminal procedure and various statutes. They also exercise supervisory jurisdiction over subordinate courts. They are vested with the power to hear references for the confirmation of death sentences and may also be consulted in the matter of exercise of the prerogative of mercy by the president or governor, revisional powers are also granted to the high courts. In a democracy, the legal system and the judiciary are important constituents within the larger political milieu. Much of the common law introduced in India has been codified. The basic statutes governing civil and criminal justice are the Indian Penal Code of 1860, Indian Evidence Act of 1872 and the Code of Criminal Procedure 1973 and the Code of Civil Procedure 1908. Codification of laws made the law uniform throughout the country and fostered a kind of legal unity in fundamental laws. The codes apply uniformly throughout the nation. The great value of this achievement of maintaining a basic unity in the area of fundamental laws has been recognized by the present constitution and it seeks to maintain the same even in the face of a federal structure. India's constitution and secondary legislation offers the legal possibilities to create alternative courts and tribunals. The modern judiciary in India derives its sources from the constitution and acts as a check on the arbitrary decisions of the legislature and the executive. The constituent assembly foresaw the significance of judiciary as a guardian of rights and justice. While the Supreme Court is the highest court of law in India whose decisions are equally binding on all, the high courts and the subordinate courts ensure justice at the state and district levels respectively.
the institutional responsibility for legal system reform is divided between various branches of the government. The law ministry and the law commission initiate policy reform while state legislatures and parliament develop the legislative framework. At the national and state level, the judiciary and judicial academies lead internal management reform and tackle problems of quality and staffing. While this institutional framework promises continuous engagement with the Indian legal system, there is a lack of empirical and analytical rigor in the processes of reform initiated by such institutions. Now, this is time for your self-study. If you want to learn more for enhancing your knowledge, you may log on to our website www.cec.nic.in for assignments, MCQs, quizzes and LORs and other materials. Till then, keep studying and goodbye.